Hi there, and welcome to Snake Therapy. I'm Shira, and this is Helios, the Dominican Red Mountain Boa. Today we're going to be tackling some of the biggest and most popular myths about snakes and smothering them with fat. For those of you who keep and love snakes, you might even be surprised that you still believe some of these myths yourself. I know I did in my earlier days of snake keeping. One of our biggest goals here on Snake Therapy is to educate people about these amazing animals in order to reduce the amount of unjustified bias against them. So as a snake keeper, the more educated you are, the better you can spread the word and contribute to that mission. These guys are very misunderstood creatures and humans have a nasty tendency to fear and hate things they don't understand. And since our other main focus is to reflect on human mental and emotional health, we'll dig into that tendency as well. Because holding on to fear or prejudice of anything, whether it's snakes or lots of little tiny holes, doesn't do anyone's health any good. The more we open our minds, the freer we are to live happier, healthier lives. And the less we vilify other beings, the more we can increase our capacity for empathy and compassion and our understanding of the symbiotic relationship we have with all living things on this planet. So let's slither on into it. Ancient cultural myths served a function by explaining ritual and cultic customs. But at their core, myths are usually just stories made up to explain what we don't actually understand. They help fuel cognitive bias and can be dangerous when they contradict proven facts, especially when repeated over and over. Myths are all well and good for ancient cultures, but in the age of science, they do little more than boost fallacies, misinformation, and often irrational fears. They only encourage us to hold on to beliefs that are not supported by evidence or even those in direct opposition to evidence. The more I talk with people about snakes, the more I encounter misconceptions about them, and these misconceptions only prevent people from the benefits that snakes can offer us, as it does our ability to provide proper care for them as pets. So let's review some of the biggest myths about snakes and constrict the life out of them so we can help people see them for the marvelous and therapeutic animal that they are. The number one most common myth about snakes is that they are aggressive. I've talked about this in other videos about snake behavior and welfare because unfortunately, I've even heard people who work with and love snakes use this word to describe them. Snakes are not aggressive. What they can be is defensive. There's a big difference between those two words. Aggression carries offensive intent to harm, but defensiveness is a protective measure used to resist attack. Snakes don't seek to harm humans, and in fact, if they had it their way, they'd probably have nothing to do with us whatsoever. Snakes are far more afraid of us than we are of them. Snakes assume that any large, warm-blooded creature coming from above is going to be a predator. The strike of a snake in defense is specifically done to create distance between itself and a threat, and a bite in defense is done in the hopes that their aggressor will drop them and back off. A wild snake is only going to bite you if you A. intentionally or inadvertently hurt it, B. try to pick it up, or C. startle it. Wouldn't you do the same if a giant creature many times your size did any of those things to you? So if you keep snakes, but you've been disappointed by defensive behavior, it's really important that you not jump to labeling them as aggressive and give up on interacting with them altogether. The best plan is to learn more about their behavior and the best practices for handling them so you can make them feel safe. If you do that and put in some time and patience, most likely you'll be able to establish a trusting relationship with them and reduce their tendency towards defensive behavior. Number two, snakes are poisonous. This one was actually in the running for the number one spot, but I felt that the aggression myth was more important to tackle in regards to soothing unfounded fears. But I hear the question, is it poisonous? More often than I can count. First of all, there are only actually a few snakes in the entire world that are poisonous because poisonous 
is not the same as venomous. Poison is a toxin that enters the body by inhalation, swallowing, or absorption through the skin. Venom, on the other hand, is a toxin that affects us when injected into our bloodstream. The easiest way to remember this is quite adorably illustrated here. Poisonous, you bite it. Venomous, it bites or stings you. So those very few snakes that are poisonous? One example is the redneck keelback, which is indeed venomous and poisonous because their main diet is made up of poisonous amphibians whose toxin is then stored in the glands in the snake's body. Fascinating. Another myth that's kind of wrapped up with this one is how many snakes are venomous. People ask me about it so often that I feel like they must think most snakes are venomous, when in fact, out of the thousands of species of snakes on this planet, there are only about 600 that are venomous, and out of those, only about 7% could kill or inflict a significant wound on a human. And remember, even venomous snakes are not actually aggressive. That venom is specifically designed to immobilize their prey so it's easier to eat, and it also helps them digest it. If they bite, it's just because they're scared of you and want you to leave them alone. Number three, snakes are slimy. Anyone who works with snakes knows that this is false, but for the benefit of those who don't, yes, it's false. I hear this one come up all the time in my work with the little zoo. People reach out to touch my snakes and gasp in surprise at how soft or smooth they are, and often comment that the sensation is completely opposite to what they expected. Being cold-blooded, their skin can sometimes feel cold, but definitely not slimy. Their scales are made up of the same material that makes up human fingernails. Are your fingernails slimy? If they are, you might want to get that checked out. Number four constrictors suffocate their prey. This one is such a common misconception that even people in the reptile community still believe it. To be fair, we probably just didn't fully understand the process of constriction until fairly recently. So the myth was simply propagated because it made sense with what we could see or guess. The truth is that when a snake constricts its prey, it's actually killing it in a much faster and more efficient manner than suffocation. It's stopping the circulation of blood to the animal's vital organs. The heart of the animal can't pump against the pressure of the constriction, so this could also cause cardiac arrest. Number five, snakes dislocate their jaws when eating. I've already gone over this in another episode when discussing the physiology of snakes in order to explain why they're such incredible contortionists and escape artists. It's pretty incredible stuff and very important to know if you keep snakes as pets. So check that out when you can. And while you're at it, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, give us a like, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. But in case you haven't seen that video, and since we need to debunk this myth, let's just take a look at a snake's skull. A snake's bottom jaw is separated into two bones connected at the chin by ultra-stretchy ligaments, and similar ligaments connect their jaw bones to their craniums. This, along with their very flexible skin, allows the snake's mouth to open up wide enough to eat prey many times bigger than its head and allows its jaws to move independently from each other and the top of its skull to walk that prey item down its throat. After a snake eats a large prey item, you might see them doing something that looks like yawning, but a bit weirder. It's called mouth gaping. And although it is cute to assume they're yawning, what they're actually doing is realigning their jaws after having them stretched out so far to eat a meal. They do this for other reasons too, in preparation for a meal or to detect chemical cues from their environment. We'll get into that a bit more in a future episode because it's really fascinating. Number six, head and pupil shape reveal if a snake is venomous or not. Nope, not at all. It's commonly assumed that snakes with triangular head shapes and elliptical pupils means a snake is venomous. I group these two myths together because they're both visual misconception and similarly a dangerous method of snake identification. 
They're also a common tactic used to justify the killing of snakes. As you can see here, Helios has both a triangular head and elliptical pupils, and he is absolutely not venomous. Sure, some venomous snakes do have both, but correlation does not imply causation. There are venomous snakes that have more oval-shaped heads, like the coral or the crate, and plenty of snakes like Helios that are non-venomous that have triangular ones. Likewise, snake pupils have nothing to do with their venom or lack thereof. Most snakes with vertical slit-like pupils are nocturnal, and most with round pupils are diurnal. The shape of their pupils can change based on the amount of light, like ours, or at will. Sometimes they can change the slits when they feel threatened or round out when they feel relaxed. The reason this is dangerous seems pretty obvious to me. If you assume a snake is non-venomous and don't act with care around it, you could end up getting a life-threatening surprise. And it's dangerous for snakes because people often kill them out of fear if they assume them to be dangerous to humans. All that is to say, don't believe the hype about the shape of snake body parts. Number seven, and the absolute worst, a good snake is a dead snake. Every time I've heard this uttered, my heart breaks a little bit. If only I could just get the people that feel that way to look at this or this or this. I mean, if that doesn't illustrate to someone that snakes are not evil nor deserving of persecution, I'd say they might need some really strong prescription glasses. If you have ophidiophobia, well, you're probably not watching this video, but I really hope you are, because I want nothing more than to help you get beyond what is actually an irrational fear, which only keeps you chained to your own unhappiness. Not only are these animals intelligent, adorable, and capable of developing relationships with humans, they are more importantly essential to the natural ecosystem of the planet. Although they're often persecuted as pests, they actually play a necessary and important role in keeping rodent populations down, which in turn can benefit us. They eat animals that carry Lyme disease-filled ticks or the creatures that devour your garden. All animals are part of this system, and when one is removed from the equation, especially a predator, the entire balance is disturbed. Okay, now I'm about to share something horrible with you, so if you're sensitive, you might want to skip the next chapter. But just know that I'm doing this because what I want is for you to get angry about it, and then to contribute to the effort to stop it from happening. What I'm about to talk about and show you is one of the most horrific acts by humans that believing myth number seven helps to encourage. Okay? You've been warned. Myth and bias don't just keep us from the truth, but have consequences. And for snakes, they can be devastating ones. The rattlesnake roundup is a practice held across the state, the largest of which is held yearly in Sweetwater, Texas. And despite the name, it's not a roundup, it's a massacre. Each year, tens of thousands of rattlesnakes are taken from the wild to be displayed and viciously slaughtered for entertainment and profit. Professional hunters and those who pay to accompany them on guided hunts are not bound by bag or take limits, and they go out to remove snakes from their native habitats, knowing they'll be awarded with cash prizes for bringing in the most and biggest snakes. Most of the snakes are caught by pouring gasoline into their winter dens, which pollutes surrounding land and water, and can impact up to 350 other wildlife species. The snakes are often kept in terrible conditions for long periods without food or water before the event, and then on the day are dumped into a pit to be violently killed in front of an audience. They are stepped on and kicked, shot in the head with bolt guns, decapitated, skinned, and chopped into parts. And in case you weren't aware, snakes can actually continue living for a while after being decapitated, and therefore they can continue to feel Pain. Although the Sweetwater Jaycees organization claims that this practice is intended to curb rattlesnake overpopulation, 
science doesn't support this claim. And it's just common sense that any species killed off in such high numbers will have a significant impact on the ecosystem. This has very likely contributed to the steep decline in some rattlesnake species overall. No matter what you believe about snakes, this type of extermination is not only inhumane, it's despicable. And what it actually reveals is that humans are in fact the evil ones. Yeah, I've had plenty of good long cries over this, and although I am sorry to show this to you, I need more people to know about it so that we might be able to stop it. So what can we do to help? To start, you could visit Advocates for Snake Preservation at rattlesnakeroundups.com or the Action Network Petition, both of which I've put in the description below to find out how you can pitch in. Otherwise, you can simply speak out to and educate anyone who might carry the belief that snakes are evil or deserve to be exterminated. Trust me, I hated showing you that, but it's really important to understand that without education and debunking of myths, the cruelty and hatred towards snakes will continue to cause harm not only to them, but to our entire system. You don't have to love them as much as I do, but you do need to recognize that they're deserving of life just as much as we are and that without them, the planet, which means humans too, will suffer. When we hold on to these knee-jerk reactions and hateful judgments about something, we are closing our minds to knowledge, unnecessarily increasing our anxiety levels, and removing opportunities for positive things like wonder, empathy, compassion, and joy. Those are the things that snakes can offer us if we simply take a moment and learn more about them. So to bring up the mood a bit, here is some of that good stuff to warm even the most cold-blooded of human hearts. Well, I hope that took some sting out of the last section. So if you learned something today, do me a favor before you go and subscribe, like the video and hit that notification bell. And more importantly, spread the word. Myths and legends are only fun when they do no harm. So let's do some good and constrict the heck out of those uninformed myths about snakes. Let me know in the comments if you believed any of those myths or if you think I should do a follow-up episode, because boy, are there a lot more myths out there to bust. Hop over to the Patreon page and join the community. Members receive ad-free and extra content, some special gifts, and of course, my eternal gratitude. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again next time for more snake therapy.